Hello everybody and welcome to your next lecture in Tides for Oceanography. Uh, we're going to be talking about kind of a strange phenomenon today called amphidromic points. So amphidromic points, what could that possibly mean? Well, we'll get into all of that uh, today and uh, finish up a little bit about how tides affect marine life. So um, we're getting into all this stuff today and then uh, after this, we'll have a little bit on coastlines and marine life in the next subsequent lectures. So uh, you're all most welcome. Um, so let's get into this whole idea of amphidromic points for, for tides, uh, second lecture of tides. So I'm going to make this big. Uh, so I want you to take a look at this map. It's a very important map, and it shows tide uh, maximum tide, tidal ranges around the globe. Okay, so it's a map of maximum tidal ranges okay and what you'll notice is that tides are not the same everywhere right uh, they are not the same everywhere tidal ranges are not the same everywhere some places have big tides some places actually have hardly uh, any tide at all if you look at the places that are blue this color of blue right you will notice uh, that they have zero tide so if you look around the globe you will notice some points like right here, you know, right here, right here in which we are blue, right? And, and there's, there's no tide at all, right? So actually it might interest you to know that uh, there are something like 12 or 13 of these areas, these little zones in which there's no tidal range at all, okay? Those places which have no tidal range are called amphidromic points, okay? So it sounds like a really, um, complex word, but it's a rather simple idea. It's just a place that has no tide, okay? And there are these certain points around the world. What does get kind of difficult, though, is trying to understand why these places have such low tides, right? They don't have, it, or low tidal ranges. They don't have, uh, they have virtually no tidal range at all. Tides just don't affect them. So there's your amphidromic points. And, you know, in your, uh, one of the first things you have to do in your lecture assignment for today, I'm kind of bringing up your lecture assignment, but one of the first things you got to do is say, what's the amphidromic points, right? Amphidromic points are just places on Earth. There's about 12 or 13 of these places which there is no tide, okay? There's no tidal range, or as is tidal range is zero. And then you have to kind of draw in where you find those amphidromic points on, um, on the map, okay? So uh, th there, it's all written out for you right there. There's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 of them here. There's actually more than that because there's some down. There's, and then there's another amphidromic point right down there, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but anyway, you got to draw out, um, just kind of put points on your map about where, where those things are. Okay. Um, so I want to show you, this is, a, this is a GIF kind of video showing, uh, I, so I circled amphidromic points. And this is showing... Um, tides over the course of a day okay and i want you to notice that the tides kind of sweep um sweep around and uh you know you, they kind of move around the surface of the earth in sort of a sweeping motion but they sort of it, it's kind of funny because they almost like try to avoid these amphidromic points right so um i want to explain why that is it's kind of interesting um <clears throat> so again here's another another um a uh, GIF video showing like amphidromic points and how tidal ranges vary over the course of a day. Uh, I shouldn't say tidal ranges, but actual tides uh, vary over the course of a day. And it's kind of interesting, almost looks as if they are rotating around these amphidromic points. You see that? And it, what's kind of interesting, it almost kinda looks like a clock, right? And what's kind of interesting, you'll notice the tides kind of move counterclockwise, seems to move almost counterclockwise around the amphidromic points, at least in the northern hemisphere. And uh, in the southern hemisphere, uh, let's see, they still seem to be moving. Some of them are, seem to be all still to be moving kind of, uh, kind of clockwise, right? So um, it's kind of interesting because you'll notice that in the southern hemisphere, these tides seem to be kind of spinning around the amphidromic points in a clockwise motion. In the north, northern hemisphere, they're going in a counterclockwise motion. Well, whenever you see something like that, you know, clockwise in the north and counterclockwise in the south or vice versa. That should always make you think of, hmm, I bet Coriolis effect has something to do with this. And if that's what you're guessing, you'd be right. So, of course, Coriolis effect does uh, play a big role here. So, 
Um, amphidromic circulation develops around these nodes. Nodes are just node just means point, right? These points called amphidromic points. Um, so let me kind of go through just an example of why these amphidromic points uh, play out the way that they do. Okay, so we're just gonna we're just gonna kind of like take like a like a, a case study of one. Okay, so this is gonna be the one that's off the coast of uh, California, you know, out in the Pacific. Okay, between California and Hawaii. Okay, so imagine that what happens is, of course, the tidal surge is gonna be coming from the east. Why does it come from the east? Because the Earth is spinning from east to west. Right, the sun rises in the east, the uh, the moon rises in the east and sets in the west. So tidal surges always kind of, the force always kind of begins in the east, okay? However, you know that uh, water is always gonna get deflected by Coriolis effect, right? So in the northern hemisphere, that tidal surge comes from the east maybe, but it's immediately gonna get deflected in the northern hemisphere to the right like that, okay? So uh, then that tidal, so it gets deflected by the uh, Coriolis effect it verges off to the right, and then it it runs along the north coast and moves to the west like that. So what ends up happening is that it just kind of avoids, it happens to avoid that point. There's nothing particularly like special at these points. It's not like you could ever maybe predict exactly where these points are, points are, but it just happens like with all the different factors that play out that affect tides. You know, there's like 45 different factors that affect tides are extremely complex uh, phenomena to understand. It just so happens that these are points on Earth that experience no tidal range, okay? Um, but it's it's mostly the direction. So what, what really determines why certain amphidromic points form where they form? Well, so number three is saying, you know, what causes the amphidromic points? You know, why do they form? What are some of the influencing factors here? It's the direction from which the tidal surge is coming, which is always going to be from the east. It's the Coriolis effect. And it's the shape of the continents and the coastlines, okay? And all those factors play out such that that's where you end up having no, um, it's the shape of the ocean basin too, you know, because some places experience seiche waves, create tides from the seiche effect. Um, so it's, you know, it's complicated and it's, but those are, I just want you to be familiar. You don't necessarily have to be able to explain exactly how this all plays out. You don't have to be able to predict where you think a amphidromic point would form. Nobody could do that. But you do need to be kind of able to explain some of the factors that are coming into play here, okay? The direction from which the tidal surge is coming from, the, the Coriolis effect, and the shape of the ocean basin or the shape of the continents, the coastlines, okay? Those are, those are the factors that are influencing the, the um, placement of the amphidromic points, okay? Um, so I've used this word, uh, you know, I've used this word uh, amphidromic points, and so hopefully they, they make sense to you now and why they kind of rotate clockwise and counterclockwise. Why are they rotating clockwise and counterclockwise around these certain points? Hey has to do with the Coriolis effect. Very, very simple. As soon as you see like, as soon, like whenever you see anything where it's like there's rotation one direction in the north and rotation in another direction in the southern hemisphere, it should always be thinking, this has got to be Coriolis effect. All right, so uh, let's talk also a little bit about ocean basins, the shape, the size of the ocean basin, and how that affects the tidal pattern. Because like I said in the previous, just got finished, you know, talking about amphidromic points, what is one of the influencing factors of amphidromic points? It's the shape of that ocean basin. You know, it's the shape of the coastlines in that particular place that can influence things. So, um, tidal ranges. Uh, what is a tidal range? You know, I, I've used that word a few times now. Um, but what tidal range is is just the difference between average distance between the low tide and the high tide. That's all. Um, do lakes have tidal ranges? Yeah, they do actually. Um, but because the amount of water that's in a lake is relatively small compared to an ocean basin, um, the tidal ranges are very, very small. They're usually only like five centimeters. So lakes like the Great Lakes, a beautiful picture of one of the Great Lakes. I don't know if this is Lake Superior or Lake Michigan, but it's one of the beautiful, one of our beautiful Great Lakes. Uh, they only get tidal ranges maybe like five centimeters. Okay. Um, places like uh, kind of small enclosed seas like the Mediterranean or the Caspian Sea or the Black Sea, um, they're also going to have relatively small tidal ranges. So you'll notice here 
um, in the, this is a picture of the Mediterranean, right? Uh, there's the Mediterranean and uh, it's really only getting like maybe at the very worst, okay, it's getting uh, just very small tidal ranges, right? So just 0.1 to negative 0.1, right? So these are just like 10 centimeters tidal ranges that are maybe like only 10 centimeters, very, very small, okay? Um, so basins like the Gulf of St. Lawrence, however, uh, that are wide and, asymm and uh, symmetrical can actually have these amphidromic points within them and uh, they can have pretty severe uh, tidal ranges. So you know I already showed you the Bay of Fundy. We started off the whole tidal lecture yesterday with the Bay of Fundy. These have extreme tides, right? Uh, so despite the fact this is a relatively small enclosed sea basin, they get these extreme tides, 49 foot, 15 meter uh, tidal ranges, huge. The reason for it is really very interesting, and I hope that I can try to explain this, uh, why the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, Canada, is so special and so interesting. So this actually has to do with the phenomenon of resonance. It has to do with the phenomenon of resonance. So you might be wondering, what do, what do high tides in the Bay of Fundy have to do with resonance? What is resonance, actually? Uh, resonance, you might know resonance if, uh, for example, you, you may be seen things where a um, singer is letting out a, a high note and it actually causes, you've probably seen like cartoons and things where it causes the glass to shatter and things like that. It's actually, that's the same phenomenon of resonance. So let me show you some examples of this. So first of all, I just want to remind you about what sish waves are because we talked about that a couple lectures back. So sish waves are this kind of sloshing back and forth rhythmic sloshing of water in a basin. Of course, it happens in your coffee cup, right? You know, if you are, uh, if you rock it at just the right frequency, it will start sloshing out of your cup. Uh, and it happens in ocean basins as well. You get a sish effect where they're sloshing right back and forth um, of, the, of the water in the water basin. So that's a sish effect, right? Sish waves. Now, let me show you a little bit about resonance okay and you can kind of think about this um, think about the coffee in my coffee cup here right I, I don't want to spill it but if I vibrate my coffee cup like this see what I'm doing everyone there's no threat of the coffee coming out likewise if I do it really kind of like this okay there's no threat of the coffee coming out but if I vibrate it at just the right frequency, kind of like this, then I already see my coffee is about to spill out, so I'm not going to do it. But but you kind of have to get it. At, you kind of have to vibrate that coffee cup at the right frequency to get the coffee to start sloshing out. Okay. Well, think of the Bay of Fundy as the coffee cup, right? The tidal range, the uh, the tide, the tidal range, the huge tidal range is actually caused by the fact that. The tide effect, the periodicity of the tide effect, right, of the of the moon coming up, rising, setting, causing the tides, uh, happens to be at the same frequency as the sish effect, the sloshing back and forth in that bay. Okay, and that it's it's a resonance effect that causes it to have these extreme tides. So let me show you more videos on resonance. Okay, here's another video on resonance. So I want you to take a look. This guy has set up all these different pendulums, and he's going to vibrate. Um, He's going to vibrate uh, some of these or start some of these swinging. You'll notice that some of them will swing and some of them won't. So just take a look, okay? It's to help you to understand resonance. So resonance with pendulums, okay? So there's the pendulums, different lengths of pendulums, and he's going to swing this red one, okay? Now notice that none of the other pendulums start swinging except for the other pendulum that has the same length. Do you see that? So the other pendulums don't swing. Why? It's because the pendulums with the same lengths have the same what's called natural frequency. And when something is driven at the same natural frequency, uh, when, it, when it starts getting an oscillating driving force that matches its, its, um, its natural frequency of vibration, it will start to resonate. So nat when, when you get the same driving force with the same frequency as the natural frequency, it causes renance, resonance, and that amplifies the amplitude of the wave. Okay. 
So notice now he's got this longer pendulum and nothing is resonating with that, right? Nothing's resonating with that. Why? Because the driving force, that long pendulum swinging, the driving force, does not match any of the natural frequencies of the other pendulums, okay? So, so that's how that all works, okay? Here's another example. Let's see if this comes up. Yeah. This is another interesting example. So this guy has set up these three different, um, this uh, kind of three different, I don't know what to call them, like little blocks that um, have a certain natural frequency of vibration. The shortest block right here is going to vibrate at the fastest frequency. This one in the middle is the middle, and this one's going to vibrate at the lowest frequency, okay? So you, so what this guy's going to do is he's going to gradually increase the driving force frequency, and you're going to see that some of these will start resonating while others don't, okay? So take a look. So right now the frequency is very low, right? So nothing's vibrating because um, the frequency is very low. So this guy's going to start slowly increasing the frequency. And what you're going to see is that this one right here, this the, the, long, the longest one, is going to be the first one to start resonating. And the reason is because it's going to have the longest wavelength and the shortest frequency, or the, the longest frequency, okay? Um, so this big one's going to start resonating first. Right, you see that? See how it's starting to starting to resonate. So the reason that it's shaking and the others are not is because the natural frequency at which it shakes is matching the driving force frequency. Okay. So now it's really going right, and it's going to get even worse. This thing's going to really start shaking a lot. Okay, as as more and more the driving force frequency comes to match the natural frequency of the shaking of that block. Okay, so there you go. At four hertz, four rotations a second, you get really extreme resonance, right? But notice that the other two are not shaking at all. Why? Because the driving force does not match the, um, the natural frequency of the, of the, um, of the blocks. Okay, now notice that the big one has stopped shaking and now the middle one is starting to shake, okay? Now what you'll notice actually, this is kind of interesting, is you'll notice you'll start to get some frequencies where the long and the short one will, will vibrate a little bit and that's because they're actually at harmonic frequencies, the fre frequencies that are harmonic with the, um, the natural, uh, natural frequency of vibration. So 6.35 hertz, now the middle one is shaking, okay? It's resonating. Okay, and now it's gonna start gradually increasing the vibration rate, the frequency rate. And as that really starts picking up, we're gonna start seeing the littlest one start to vibrate. Okay, so they really got to pick it up to get it to get it to resonate. So this has a very high frequency of nat natural frequency, right? Okay. There we go. So I think you get the idea, but okay, what's the natural frequency? The natural frequency is the frequency at which uh, an object naturally vibrates. And it could be a lot of things. It could be a pendulum, it could be one of these blocks, right? It could be a mass on a spring, okay, whatever it is. And it could be the sloshing of water back and forth in, a, in an ocean basin, right? So there's a certain natural frequency to how water moves the Seiche effect in an, in an ocean basin. Now, if the driving force of the tides, the periodicity of the tides, right, the tides going up and coming down, going up and coming down, coming up, going down, matches the natural frequency of that basin, the Seiche effect, then you get these extreme tidal ranges, okay? And it's a resonance effect. It's the same as what I showed you, the same 
with resonance. So the rhythmic rocking back and forth of water in the basin, the natural frequency of the Seiche waves in a basin equals the frequency of the tidal driving force. That means having a periodicity of 12, about 12 hours, right? Up and down to two tidal ranges a day, you get a huge tidal, you know, huge tidal range. So that's exactly what happens um, in the Bay of Fundy. To a lesser extent, you get um, you get ones uh, in the North Sea that are very great. You get tidal ranges in the North Sea that are very great. So you see right here, um, this is the UK, this is Europe, and right here between um, Europe and France and, and the UK, you get uh, these very big tidal ranges too, right? It's because the, the water in that basin matches, it's about the right size that it matches the um, tidal the, the driving the periodicity of the tidal force right um, also this happens in the Gulf of California that little basin ocean basin between Mexico and Baja California um, you get the same thing right um, this is kind of an interesting video this is showing uh, so kind of moving on from this now um, I hope that you can answer number eight so, you know it talks about the Bay of Fundy why does I have such big big uh, tidal ranges you got to mention something you know about about resonance and natural frequencies in there uh, to get that right. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on from here, and we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, tidal waves, um, which I'm pretty sure you've heard about before, but maybe you're not exact not exactly sure what a tidal range is. Uh, tidal tidal range. Uh, tidal tidal wave is. So we're going to talk about those. Sometimes tidal waves are called tidal bores. Um, so I want you to take a look at this GIF. This is showing the um, water level from the tides in the Bay of San Francisco. And you'll notice that the water in the bay is kind of like gradually increasing and like almost like it's flowing into the bay and out of the bay, okay? Um, and this happens in our own bay, by the way, of Corpus Christi. So um, you might get a high tide, you might notice this, we'll get the high tide along the coast. Like let's say if you pretend this is Corpus Christi, maybe we get the high tide along the island, um, right you know right now but then it's going to take some time for that high tide water to reach the interior of the bay okay so the high tide for example the high tide on the island on Padre Island is not going to be the same as the high tide in the bay okay in Corpus Christi Bay um, so this actually creates within the within bays or enclosed areas like that actually creates something called tidal bores so this picture you're seeing right here is actually a tidal wave and what's kind of cool about tidal waves is that they create very long sustained waves that can go on for a long time. So people can actually surf these waves. And uh, the longest sustained surf of a guy or, you know, or a girl, I don't know who it was a guy or a girl, but surfing was something like 37 minutes or 45 minutes because they were surfing along one of these tidal bores. So imagine that. Uh, so a tidal bore is a wall of water that surges up river or up uh, into a bay. Uh, with the advancing high tide. So this is a really good uh, video um, taken from National Geographic, uh, and it shows um, a tidal bore moving up one of the um, Chinese rivers. I can't remember which river this is in China. So this full moon, you know, a spring tide is going to bring this tidal surge up the up the river. So look at this. This is the tidal surge. This is a river, you know. And you you might look at this and think, wow, this is the ocean. It's not the ocean. It's a river. So this huge tidal bore, huge tidal wave has come moving up the river like this. And it comes, I guess, it comes around the um, around the um, I don't know how to pronounce that Hangzhou. Uh, Queen Tang River, Kuang Tang, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I'm not sure what the name of the river is exactly. But you can see that this tidal bore moving up the river is a massive river too. Um, very interesting. So anyway, um, that's, uh, that's, that's what tidal waves are about. Um, so that's what a real tidal wave is. Uh, tides coming in and out of the bays uh, create currents, okay? Um, so as the water comes in with the rising tide, it creates what's called the flood current. 
uh, and as the water comes out, these are called ebb currents. This is a really big deal for us in Corpus Christi because we have a bay, right? And there's only really a few outlets uh, going from the Corpus Christi Bay into the Gulf of Mexico, right? Um, there are places, you know, these are places like Packery Channel. I know a lot of people like to fish in Packery Channel, right? Um, it's a really a big deal because there's this is a, one of the few places where there's an outlet from the Bay of Corpus Christi into the the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, um, so this is where you get really strong ebb currents and flood currents. So a lot of water coming in, a lot of water going out, and that's why it's such a popular place to fish. There's a lot of action. It's like a little freeway, right, for fish and for other marine animals and other marine species. You know. Uh, certain times of the year, you can go to Packery Channel and just see this amazing uh, parade of uh, sea turtles coming in and out of the bay. You know, it's really it's really quite remarkable. So, you know, hundreds you could sometimes see just hundreds of sea turtles. Maybe you know what I'm talking about if you've ever gone around Packery Channel. But it's a special place. You know, if you haven't been to Packery Channel, it's uh, worth going over there and uh, fishing a little bit and um, and uh, checking it out because there's a lot to see there. Um, so flood currents happen when the tide is coming in, it fills up the bay, and then the ebb currents come out are created when the when the uh, tides you know go low, and the water starts emptying out of the bay. Okay, so it's very very important for a lot of marine species. So uh, one very popular fishing species here, this ugly fish, is known as a flounder, right? A southern flounder. It's an ambush. It's an ambush predator. And what does it do? The reason it's flat like that is it buries itself in the sand and it waits at the um, inlets uh, to the bay. It waits during the flood tides and it waits there to ambush prey that's being washed into the bay from the flood tide. Okay, That's why if you like to fish flounder, um, you really have to pay a lot of attention to the tides. They're very sensitive to tides because they use those flood tides to, to ambush prey. Okay, so um, that's an example of you know an animal that uses a marine animal that uses tides. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, this is of course not Corpus Christi because it has some beautiful hills and lush verdant green uh, pastures here, but um, where would you expect to find find flounder? Like if you were going to trying to fish for flounder, you know you're you're going to be looking around the uh, entrance to the bay right here. And of course, you're especially going to be looking at like sandy flats and areas like that. They like to be in shallow water and uh, relatively shallow water in sandy areas, in muddy areas where they can bury themselves. And sometimes they're only in inches of water, right? And they like to be on the inside of these inlets that are going into a bay, okay? Uh, what are some other species? Uh, you might have seen these little guys that are on Padre Island. These are ghost crabs. And it's, ghost crab is a good, good name for them because they're white, of course, but... They also uh, hide immediately you know, as soon as they see you. They go running into their hole. They kind of disappear like a ghost. Um, so ghost crabs come out of their burrows after a high tide, and they go and search for detritus that was left on the beach after the high tide has receded. So the tide goes out, and then they come out of their crabs, come out of their holes, and they start foraging for for whatever was left by the the tide. These little ugly things are horrifying looking, um, but they're uh, they're called sand fleas. Um, you can actually buy these sometimes if you I don't know if people like to fish, but uh, you can actually buy these at bait shops sometimes. Um, but what they do is they crawl into the sand, and they uh, they stay always in the surf zone. And the reason they like to be in the surf is because the surf churns up a lot of sand and sediment, and it churns up a lot of food that they go and they filter feed. So they're filtering through. They have they have uh, filtering structures for their mouthpiece, allows them to filter the turbulent water and kind of suck out plankton and other little things. Um, if you like to fish for pompano, uh, pompano their favorite food to eat are these little guys, these sand fleas. So really, um, and they actually have things, they little mechanisms you can use to catch sand fleas in the sand as the water recedes from the from the um, surf. And uh, you can use those to catch pompano. Pompano just love them. Okay, now I'm, I bet that you have seen these little guys at the island too. These are coquina crabs, 
and or coquina crabs, coquina clams, and they're really really interesting little creatures. So you've probably seen these guys before. You know the surf comes in and you see all these little clams, and then you see them instantly burrow down again into the sand. So these guys again, they like to be in the surf zone, and of course the surf zone moves up and down the beach. You know further up the beach or further down the beach. Um, as the tides come in and go out, right? So these guys are constantly moving with the surf. So they actually, even though it seems like they just sit there, they don't. You know, they're very active little animals. And uh, you've probably seen the surf come in and they instantly burrow down. They have a little tube that comes out and they use that to suck in water and filter feed, right? Because they, they like the surf. A lot of animals like the surf because the turbulent water churns up a lot of food that they can um, they can take advantage of, right? Um, another animal, yet another animal that's highly affected by the tides are oysters, right? So oysters, although oysters often form in deep water, deeper, relatively deep water, um, they also can form very close to the coast. So oyster reefs develop in intertidal areas. They usually open their shells to filter feed during the high tide and then close them during the low tide. Okay. Uh, now this is something you wouldn't see here in Corpus Christi, but it's a really big deal in Southern California. Um, there's this little fish called the grunion and uh, in Southern California there's something called grunion runs and basically just thousands and thousands millions I should say of these little fish beach themselves during a spring tide a high tide okay a very high tide uh, they will mate and they will deposit their eggs in that very high tide then um, at the next spring tide about nine days later the high tide will wash the developed eggs back out to sea. So they take advantage of the tides. And of course, people obviously are going to love to collect these guys and fry them up and make uh, whatever little meal to eat off of them. Okay. Um, so people love grunion, grunion runs in Southern California. And of course, there are a lot of other species that take advantage of grunion runs too. So these are California hal halibut that, uh, that like to eat the grunion as well. All right, so uh, that's just a little bit about um, marine life that kind of takes advantage of tides. Um, the last little thing I want to talk about before we wrap up today is about um, tides and energy. Because, you know, uh, a lot of people are trying to look for other ways of generating energy uh, apart from fossil fuels like coal and uh, petroleum and natural gas which is very understandable since it creates a lot of carbon dioxide, which can be problematic for our, for our climate and for our atmosphere. Um, so people are looking, trying to develop other ways of generating electricity. One thing that has been investigated are using tides, right? Tides to generate electricity. So this is actually a, um, this big machine that you see right here is actually a, uh, for generating electricity from the tides. Um, so these are tidal turbines in um, Northern Ireland. Basically what happens is as the tide comes in, um, it will spin the turbine and then it will use the flood tide to spin the turbine. And then uh, when the tide goes out, it can again open up the flood gates or the seich gates and use that to, uh, to uh, power the turbine yet again, okay? Or sluice gates, I'm sorry, not seich gates, sluice gates. Um, so you get a level of high tide. And what's kind of um, nice about this is that you can open these sluice gates or close them, and you have a little bit more control over um, when the energy gets, uh, gets released. Do you see what I mean? So some of the problems, for example, with like green energy or, or sustainable energy, things like solar and wind power, one of the things that sucks about them is that, um, you know, solar energy, you're only, you're only generating energy when the sun is out which is only half the day um, for for um, uh, what do you call it for wind power you're only generating energy when there's wind which sometimes there's wind sometimes there's not wind right uh, but with with these tidal um, of course one thing that tides are much more predictable you know it, it's not like you're never gonna have a time in which there's no tides right uh, in places that have tidal ranges, you know, not at an amphidromic point, but places that have good tidal ranges, you're always going to have tides. It doesn't depend on the weather. Okay, so it's more reliable. Um, that's one good thing about tidal energy. It's more reliable than other kinds of green energy. And another thing is that you can actually close these sluice gates during the high tide, and then you can release it. You have a little more control over releasing the water and generating electricity from the release of the water. So you have a little bit more control about um, when you need that energy. 
Uh, do you see what I mean? So like, for example, solar energy, you can't, you can't produce any solar energy at nighttime, right? But with this, you can close sluice gates and capture the water when the, when the, during the high tide, and then you can release the water and generate energy that way um, at your discretion, right? So, so there's a little bit more control over it. Uh, here's a tidal energy plant on the Rance River in France. It generates 544 million kilowatt hours annually, uh, and that's about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so it means 65 million. So if you're charging 12 cents per kilowatt hour, which is pretty typical cost of electricity, that means $65 million a year, and it only costs $75 million to construct. So that's pretty cool because it was pretty, because a lot of coal power plants, you know, they cost something like billions of dollars to create or a billion dollars to create, whereas this only costs $75 million, pays for itself in about one year. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, you know, a pro of, of the tidal energy. However, um, here's a coal fired power plant in Taiwan. Um, it produces. 57 times the power of a typical tidal uh, ener energy generating plant. So one of the down downsides of tidal energy is that it's just not much energy. You know, um, this coal-fired power plant is producing many times the amount of energy that uh, a tidal energy plant produces. So tidal energy is cheap. It's fairly reliable. For green energy, it's you know sustainable energy. It's pretty reliable. Um, it is also, um, of course, environmentally you know maybe you could argue it's environmentally healthier than coal-fired power plants. Of course, it does have some effect. Building dams along you know uh, the inlets to bays uh, is not always you know totally ener uh, environmentally friendly, but it's probably better than a coal-fired power plant. Um, However, the downside to it is they just don't produce that much energy. That's that's the downside. So, um, and also another downside is that you can't just put them anywhere, right? You can't have tidal energy at an amphidromic point because there's no tides, right? So you can't just put this anywhere. Whereas with coal, you can put a coal-fired power plant almost anywhere. Um, you know, with coal also, it takes money to extract the coal. It takes money to extract the natural gas, right? Whereas tides are free. So that's that's kind of cool too. So coal-fired power plants and natural gas power plants are more expensive to build. So, you know, you're talking about three to nine billion dollars per plant versus maybe a hundred million dollars for a tidal range plant. Okay. Um, main benefit of tidal energy is it doesn't release CO2 uh, into our atmosphere and other pollutants. So that's a that's a plus, a big plus. Um, main problem though is that there are very limited number of sites where it can work and even if every site was utilized only one percent of current energy needs could be met so it's very little energy that's that's one of the big problems but it can help right um so here's also just going to leave you uh today with this beautiful uh picture of the monastery of mont, mont saint michael in france which is a really interesting monastery uh it's this catholic monastery the monks live there in the in the uh, monastery on this little rock and what's really cool is that this place has a really high tidal range so during high tide you can only get there um via a bridge and then during low tide you you, you know you can't you you can walk over there but uh now it's kind of interesting because in the old days you there was no bridge right so the the monks were trapped there during during high tide and then you could you could travel back and forth between the monastery and the mainland during low tide but um it's really this is just a really beautiful picture and uh, a, a very beautiful place so so here comes the tide right Yeah, uh, it comes right up to the bridge, right? <laughs> it's pretty high tide range, right? So anyway, uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture, and we'll talk to you next time.